You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is. Jacob Volk. Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk, and it is time to preview the 2020 World Series Rays vs. Dodgers. The best team in each league going at it again. That's the way it should be. When you look at the Rays, it's kind of fascinating how they got here. Their hitting has really only come from three guys. Randy Rosarena. G-Man Choi, and Manuel Margot. That's it. You want to tell me Michael Perez? He's only played in five games. He only has seven at-bats. He doesn't count. I mean, Mike Zanino has been really good. He has four home runs in these playoffs. But he's also hitting two sixteen. He's feast or famine. And this is a raised team that has lived and died by the long ball. At one point, I think it was like 70% of their runs in either the ALCS or the postseason as a whole was scored on home runs. That's insane. You wouldn't think that would come from the Rays. This is a team that was in the middle of the pack in home runs in the American League this year. They had 80 home runs as a team. That put them 7th among all 15 AL teams. And I'll tell you, it's simply amazing what the Rays were able to do with guys like a Rosarena and Zanino. Find these guys off the scrap heap. Mike Zanino was a Bust for the Mariners. High draft pick. Couldn't get anything going. Ends up with a raise and has four home runs in the playoffs. Randy Arozarena, the Cardinals were more than happy to get rid of him. They had very little faith in him. The guy's hitting 382 in the playoffs. Seven homers, ten RBIs. He has a 433 on base percentage. He has 21 hits. You know how many of those have gone for extra bases? 11. More than half. This is one of the greatest individual postseasons we've ever seen. 60-game season or not, it's still incredible what a Rosarena has done. So it's a combination of those guys waking up and the pitching. As we all know, the Rays don't let their starters get that far into the game. Five, six innings if they're lucky. And then they look to shorten the game. Now, the funny thing about that is they've had a couple guys get put into high-leverage spots, and they've struggled. Nick Anderson has a 4.63 ERA. John Curtis has an 8.1 ERA. Those are two pretty big pieces for the Rays. I mean, Nick Anderson was their closer. 
He had a minuscule .55 ERA. He only gave up one earned run this year. It was on a home run. He made one bad pitch. But despite that, the Rays have been able to shorten these games. It's incredible. Kevin Cash has done a fantastic job in these playoffs. Aaron Loop, Diego Castillo, Aaron Sleggers, Pete Fairbanks, Ryan Thompson. It's insane. No one's ever heard of these guys. They're getting huge outs. And these guys are multi-inning relievers. That's the most impressive thing. You can bring them on in, hypothetically, the 7th, sit them down, and then they come back out for the 8th. There are a lot of relievers that once they sit down in that dugout and they go back out, they struggle. Cough, cough, or all this Chapman. Now, one thing that deserves to be mentioned is the road that the Rays had to go through to get here. No, I'm not talking about 60 games. I'm talking about their playoff opponents. And I mentioned this yesterday. But I'll say it again. The Blue Jays lost that series more than the Rays won it. The Yankees lost that series more than the Rays won it. The Rays were up 3-0 against the Astros. They lost three straight before rallying to win a Game 7. Now, winning that Game 7 was impressive, but bear in mind, that's against a bad postseason manager in Dusty Baker. Guy's getting talked up like he's Connie Mack. Dusty Baker has never won a World Series. Dusty Baker is a terrible playoff manager. Really good regular season manager, but he's only won one pennant. 2002. Giants are up 3-2 in that series. Come very close to winning game six. And what happens? They lose. The Rays have impressed me with their power. They've impressed me with their pitching. Blake Snell and Charlie Morton have been incredible in these playoffs. Tyler Glasnow hasn't been great. He hasn't been terrible. He's 2-1 with a 4-6-6 ERA. I mean, certainly not the Glasnow that We all thought we'd see, but he hasn't been, you know, Clayton Kershaw out there. But there's a third thing that doesn't get talked about as much, but it really should. And that's their defense. The Rays' defense is incredible. They're all over the place making these incredible plays. Diving catches, falling into the stands. Great picks by G-Man Choi at first. I used to play first base. I know how hard that is. Granted, not as a major leaguer, but still. The principle is the same. The unsung heroes of these playoffs for the Rays have been guys like Kevin Kiermaier and Joey Wendell making those great defensive plays. Look, I understand that they need to produce with the bat, but if you're not going to, make it up for me another way. I can live with that. In a perfect world, that wouldn't be the case. I would sacrifice defense for offense any day of the week. But, look, it's working for the Rays. When you're a team that's built around pitching, getting to that bullpen and preserving 
One or two run leads. Yeah, defense becomes more important. I get that. And Kevin Cash has done a fantastic job managing this team. He's pushing all the right buttons. He has a roster of guys that are making the Major League minimum. Or maybe slightly above the Major League minimum. And he has these guys four wins away from a World Series. I remember when Kevin Cash was the fourth string Yankees catcher. Jorge Posada and Jose Molina had gotten hurt. So Francisco Cervelli and Kevin Cash were carrying the load. Kevin Cash was dreadful with the Yankees. Couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. But you know what? It's usually the bad players that become the best managers. Tommy Lasorda was not a good player. Fantastic manager. Don Zimmer was not a good player. One of the most respected minds in baseball history. Bobby Cox was a terrible player. Hall of Famer. And an interesting fact about Lasorda. I know this is kind of a hard left turn, but it's the truth. You know who actually knocked Lasorda out of having a roster spot? Sandy Koufax. That's actually true. Koufax took Lasorda's spot. Koufax was a bonus baby. So he had to start with the Major League team. So Lasorda got sent down. Kind of interesting how things like that work out. But look, Cash turned his career around and has become a fantastic manager. He has managed these games perfectly. You can't say enough good things about him. And when you look at the Dodgers, they're built a lot differently than the Rays. Big payroll, heavy on offense, their bullpen is dreadful. Their starting pitching really isn't that good, but they just hit. I mean, it's kind of funny, Andrew Friedman is the president of baseball operations for the Dodgers. He used to be Rays GM. And he was GM of the Rays when they made the World Series in 2008. It's kind of interesting how things like that work out. Look, the Dodgers got here via the long ball and defense to an extent. Corey Seager had six home runs in the playoffs, and Mookie Betts has made highlight reel catch after highlight reel catch. But that's where the similarities end. Make no mistake about it. This Dodgers team is very different from the Rays. Again, big payroll. Star after star after star. Betts, Seeger, Bellinger, Bueller. It would be really incredible if after beating the Yankees, the Rays could also beat the Dodgers. The two teams that have historically spent money like no other team in baseball. When you look at the Dodgers lineup, they've gotten more overall production than the Rays have. Jock Peterson has come back and has hit really well. Betts is hitting 311. Seeger has six home runs. Bellinger has three homers and 10 RBIs. Kiki Hernandez has been good. Will Smith has been really good. He has 11 RBIs. That's the second most on the Dodgers. I understand that guys like Muncie, Turner, 
and Taylor haven't done much with the bat, but Muncy's gotten on base. He's walked 15 times. He has a 434 on base. It's better than nothing. I can live with that. Would you prefer Muncy to be better with the bat? Obviously. But, again, I can live with it. Pitching, though, is really where the Dodgers have struggled. You have Kershaw, who's a terrible postseason pitcher. Maybe he gets it done in playoff games where there's not a lot on the line, but in a game that you really want to win, you can't trust him. Kenley Jansen was removed from the closer role at one point. Now, granted, as it stands right now, he seems to have righted the ship, but he can revert to bad Kenley Jansen at any time. Blake Trinan failed as Dodgers closer. Bruzdar Gratterall has been really bad. Jake McGee has been bad. Adam Kolarik has been bad. Tony Gonsolin has been bad. What are the Dodgers going to do outside of starting Bueller and Kershaw? Urias? You have to, but realize you want him getting deep into games. You don't want a situation where you have to pull him after four innings. This Dodgers bullpen can't get a bunch of outs. If the Dodgers are going to win this World Series, it's going to be by scoring a bunch of runs. They're not going to win one nothing games, or 2 nothing games, or 3-2 games. They've got to score 5, 6, or 7 runs. But if any team can do that, it's the Dodgers. I do think Justin Turner can get back on track. In his two World Series, he's hit 245. That's not great, but that's not bad. I do think that Betts is going to keep playing well. I do think that Seager is going to keep hitting a lot of home runs. Bellinger may have a couple more clutch home runs. This Dodgers lineup, to me, is just unbeatable. The old adage that good pitching beats good hitting? I get that. I promise I do. But realize, once the Rays get into their bullpen, because Blake Snell is a great pitcher, and Charlie Morton is incredible in the playoffs, Once the Rays get into that bullpen, there's no Mariano. There's no Trevor Hoffman. I think the Dodgers are going to take advantage of these Rays relievers that, while they've been really good so far against the best lineup they've faced all year, I don't trust them. If the Dodgers can keep these games close... Heading into the later innings, they can capitalize on facing guys like Anderson and Thompson and Fairbanks. Good pitchers, but not great. They've been great so far, but again, they haven't faced Betts, Seager, Bellinger, Muncie, etc., etc., A lot of people are picking the Rays. I'm not going to do that. Dodgers in six. One thing that bears mentioning, though, is the fact that this World Series has an asterisk on it. Now, I have never said that about any World Series. I've never once said that the 2017 World Series now has an asterisk. I never said that about 2018. None of the World Series with guys who may or may not have taken steroids. 
But the winner of this World Series does have an asterisk. They won off the heels of a 60-game season. They had to play 102 less games. Look, I'm okay with some less games. If you wanted to just play like 140 games or 110 games like we've done in other weird seasons, that's fine. No asterisk. There's enough of a sample size there for me to say that what happened probably would have happened in a full season. I can't say that with 60 games. Who's to say that in the second half, realize 60 games is less than half of 162. Who's to say that in the second half of the season, the Rays wouldn't have suffered a bunch of injuries and they would have sunk like the Titanic. Who's to say that the Dodgers wouldn't have suffered a bunch of injuries? Who's to say that the Yankees wouldn't have found their stride? Who's to say that the Braves maybe would have pulled the trigger on a couple big trades to help them win that one last game? This World Series does have an asterisk. There's no way around it. And I, as a Yankee fan, have said that I'm okay with my team losing. Because I don't want the Yankees having that asterisk. Now granted, I took the loss to the Rays harder than I thought I was going to. But, that thought was in the back of my mind. It's why I wasn't as upset this year as I was last year, or the year before that, or the year before that. But for both of these teams, the Rays and the Dodgers, the asterisk doesn't matter. Realize, the Rays have never won a World Series. They've only been in one, 2008. They lost to the Phillies. The Dodgers haven't won a World Series since 1988. That's 32 years. They've been close, but they haven't been able to get over the hump since. It's not a bad thing for these franchises to have this asterisk. You want that first World Series as a franchise. I don't care how you get it. And when you're the Dodgers, a team that has spent money hand over fist, and you had to go through a bad owner in Frank McCourt, you had to go through a long drought before you even won a pennant, realize, from 1989 to 2016, the Dodgers never won the pennant. They were in the playoffs. They had gotten close to winning the pennant. But they never got there. 2017, lost to the Astros in seven games. 2018, they lost to the Red Sox in five games. They've been close so many times. They need this World Series. They need to placate their fan base. That's a restless fan base. That's a fan base that sees their team every year making big moves. Trading for Machado. Trading for Betts. Signing A.J. Pollock. Bringing Andrew Friedman over from the Rays. What do they have to show for it? Three pennants? Pennants are nice, but you know what's better? A World Series. Yes, this World Series has an asterisk. No question about that in my mind. But, that doesn't matter for these two teams. It matters for the Yankees because of their rich history. You don't want 2020 mentioned in the same breath 
as 27 and 61 and 98. For a team without that history, for a team that for the longest time was the little brother of the Yankees, and that applies to both teams in this World Series, yeah, seize this moment. Wear that World Series ring with pride. Make the t-shirts, make the hats, make the banner, go all out. The asterisk doesn't matter for the Rays and Dodgers. Moving on now to yesterday's NFL games. And I'll start with Chiefs Bills. And it's really incredible when you stop and think about how the Chiefs won this game. Patrick Mahomes, the best player in the NFL, wasn't Mahomes. He wasn't bad by any stretch. He only had five incompletions. He threw two touchdowns, both to Travis Kelsey. Helped me win one of my fantasy football matchups. But he wasn't the Chiefs' best player yesterday. You'd think that if Mahomes isn't the Chiefs' best player, they wouldn't have a great chance of winning. But that's not true. Because Clyde Edwards-Hilaire carried this team. 26 carries for 161 yards. That is an average of just over 6 yards per carry. This really disappointing Bills defense couldn't stop him to save their lives. I don't know whether it's extra motivation from seeing the Chiefs sign Le'Veon Bell, or the fact that he was given the ball so much on a rain-soaked New Era field. But Edwards Hilaire was phenomenal yesterday. Mahomes was great too, but Edwards Hilaire was phenomenal. It's kind of funny. When the Chiefs signed Bell, my buddy Nick, said, you know, I'm not crazy about this. He may take carries away from Edwards Hilaire. I don't want that. And look, I understand why you don't want any carries taken away from Edwards Hilaire. That is a fair concern for a Chiefs fan to have. This guy is really special. He's in the perfect offense for his skill set. Andy Reid said when he was drafted, that he reminded him of Brian Westbrook. I can see it a little bit. This kid is incredible. He's one of the best young running backs in the NFL. The Chiefs are just incredible. There's no other word for it. Phenomenal, awesome, insane. Every game. Your jaw just drops watching them. I can't wait for Eric Bieniemy to take over the Jets. On the other side of things, though, this was a tough game for the Bills. This was the second straight game that Josh Allen has really underachieved. Now, I understand that any quarterback can go through a rough patch. That's okay. You can live with that. But I did expect Allen to be better than he was yesterday. He was just 14 for 27 on his passes. Couldn't complete any deep passes. There was a lot of short to intermediate routes by Diggs and Beasley. The rain really got to him. And it got to Devin Singletary, too. Look, I like Singletary. I think he's very talented. I actually just tried to trade for him in my Keeper Fantasy Football League, but I couldn't get it done. But he has had a really, really disappointing 
sophomore season. He only had 10 carries yesterday for 32 yards. He's averaging 45 yards per game. 3.8 yards per carry. That's not good anymore. There used to be a time when that was good, but now you want like 4.5 yards per carry. The Bills' front seven really disappointed me. Ed Oliver was invisible. I mean, you saw his speed on one play where he was chasing down um, Edward Hilaire. But that's pretty much it. He was invisible for most of the game. I'd say that this game should scare you as a Bills fan, but you have the Jets on Sunday. You're going to cream the Jets. Every team creams the Jets. The best cure for a struggling team is going up against this college-level Jets team. Moving on now to Cardinals-Cowboys. And my God. I knew that the Cowboys would struggle without Dak Prescott. But I didn't think they'd be this bad. Andy Dalton looked dreadful. He threw two interceptions, was sacked three times. He attempted 54 passes. He didn't even get 300 yards. Remember when Andy Dalton was a pro bowler? In the immortal words of T.I., the old me is dead and gone. Ezekiel Elliott is going to get a candy bar named after him. They're going to call it Butterfingers. You cannot fumble the ball twice there. You have to be the guy to lead this Cowboys offense with Prescott out. You can't do that by fumbling twice. I mean, the Cardinals offense wasn't great in this game. Kyler Murray completed less than half of his passes. He only completed nine passes on 24 tries. But you know how many yards those nine passes went for? 188. That's an average of 21 yards per completion. That's insane. Look, Kenyon Drake is a really good running back. But he's not as good as that anemic Cowboys defense made him look. Drake had just over 8 yards per carry yesterday. He had 2 touchdowns. 20 carries for 164 yards. Kyler Murray, 10 carries for 74 yards. The Cowboys did a good job of stopping the Cardinals' passing game. They just couldn't stop the run game. This Cowboys defense is a sieve. It is Swiss cheese. It is dreadful. I don't know which defense is worse. The Cowboys defense or the Jets defense? Yet somehow the Cowboys are still in first place in the NFC least. My God. That division is dreadful. If the Eagles had some wide receivers... They'd be in first place. If the Giants had a quarterback, they'd be in first place. If the football team gave Dwayne Haskins a little more support, they'd be in first place. Yet somehow it's the Cowboys. A team with no defense. Mike Nolan may not make it through the season. It's kind of funny. A lot of Jets fans... When Gase was hired, they wanted Mike McCarthy instead. Well, this is Mike McCarthy. Two and four. The only head coach in NFL history to have his team leading their division despite having a losing record after week six. Would McCarthy have been better than Gase? 
Not by much. This year? Probably. Last year? Definitely not. I never wanted McCarthy. Always thought he was overrated. Moving on now to the Cincinnati Bengals. And they have a few unhappy players on their hands. Namely, Geno Atkins, Carlos Dunlap, and John Ross III. That comes from Tyler Dragon of the Cincinnati Inquirer and Mike Garofalo of NFL.com. Atkins and Dunlap are upset because they're not being used a lot. They're really only being used on third downs. And these guys were once staples of the Bengals. I remember when they were signed to their big contracts. Mike Brown loves loyalty. He rewarded his loyal soldiers. But this is a new era of Bengals football. No Marvin Lewis anymore. No Andy Dalton anymore. A.J. Green isn't going to be around for too much longer. This is a Bengals team that is building towards the future. And yeah, Atkins and Dunlap aren't part of that. They have a right to be frustrated. It wouldn't surprise me at all if they were traded. Even though Dunlap isn't having a great year this year, he has a great track record of success. And Geno Atkins, same thing. I mean, he was hurt for the first four games. And he's only played in 37 snaps so far this year, so limited sample size, but still, hasn't set the world on fire. I'd have no problem with a team trading for him. I think the Bengals should trade them. Build towards the future. The Bengals are 1-4-1. One, and one. They're not getting past the Steelers. They're not getting past the Ravens. They're not getting past the Browns. Don't give Atkins and Dunlap away, but... I wouldn't mind trading them for a fourth or more likely a fifth round pick. As for John Ross, I understand why he wants out. This is a guy who came into the league with a ton of talent, blew up the combine in 2017, former ninth overall pick and has never gotten a chance to strut his stuff. In his career, he only has 51 catches for 733 yards. He's a really good deep threat. The thing is, though, he just has never been able to leapfrog anyone on the Bengals' depth chart. I don't know whether that's because he's a one-trick pony or because the Bengals really prioritize guys like Green, Tyler Boyd, and T. Higgins over him. I don't begrudge Ross for wanting out. The writing's on the wall. If he's ever gonna establish himself as a good player in the NFL, it's now or never. He's not going to do it in Cincy. I don't begrudge him for wanting out. But if I was another GM, I'd hesitate to give up more than a sixth round pick for him. I really don't have a high opinion of one trick ponies like Ross who can just run deep routes. Moving on now to the Miami Dolphins making it to a time. That is right. Ryan Fitzpatrick's time as Dolphins starter is over. After the Dolphins bye week this week, Tua will get the start on week 8 against the Rams. I don't begrudge this decision at all. 
It wasn't a matter of if Tua was going to start this year. It was just a matter of when. The thing is, though, Ryan Fitzpatrick kept playing well. In his six games this year, he has two duds and four really good games. That, combined with the fact that the Dolphins wanted to give Tua time to marinate, to rehab from his injury, to learn from a veteran quarterback in Fitzpatrick, meant that he had to wait six games to really get his shot. This does give me some Eli Manning for Kurt Warner vibes. In 04 with the Giants 5-4 and four, and in striking distance of a playoff spot, the Giants decided to bench Warner for Eli. Eli finished 1-6, and six, the Giants finished 6-10. and 10. But... They wanted to start their future franchise quarterback. And you know what? Even if they had made the playoffs that year, they probably weren't going to do much. You know what? It's the same thing with the Dolphins. They're 3-3. and They're a game behind the Bills. And they're a game behind the Colts for that final wildcard spot. But even if they were to make the playoffs, they're not a Super Bowl threat. They'd be one and done. It is the right decision to start Tua. If Brian Flores and Chan Gailey and Chris Greer really think that Tua is ready to go, he's 100%, yes, start him. I have no problem with this decision at all. And let me tell you, I'd have no problem with Fitzpatrick coming back to the Jets next year. The Jets can trade Sam Darnold for a day two pick, if that. Fitzpatrick can start the first few games, and then it's Trevor time. I have no problem with that at all. There is one piece of basketball news that I want to talk about. And that concerns the Indiana Pacers making a surprising hire to replace Nate McMillan as their head coach. And that is Nate Bjorkgren, a guy who I wasn't even aware was a finalist for the Pacers job. It's okay if you don't know who Bjorkgren is. From 2011 to 2015, he bounced around the D-League as a head coach there. Then he was given a shot as an assistant coach for the Phoenix Suns. And then in 2018, Nick Nurse gave him a shot as one of his assistant coaches. Now, Bjorkren does have a couple titles to his name. He did win the 2011 D-League Championship with the Iowa Energy. And in 2019, he was with the Raptors when they won. And it seems like he has a good reputation. Players seem to like him. He seems to be able to communicate with these guys well. But this wasn't a guy who I had on any coaching radar. Forget the Pacers, just any coaching radar. I didn't know who the Pacers were going to hire, but I didn't think it would be Bjorkren. There were so many higher thought of assistants that they could have gone after. A guy like Chris Finch... Chris Quinn, David Vanterpool, Jacques Vaughn, Will Hardy, Steven Silas, Ime Udoka, Mike Brown, they all would have been better than Bjorkren. 
Look, I don't want to kill the guy before he gets started, but... It's very difficult for me to support Dark Horse hires. Make no mistake about it. This guy was a Dark Horse. I didn't even know he was being seriously considered. No report that I read indicated that Bjorkgren was a finalist for this job. Again, I don't want to kill him before he gets going, but... This is a really risky hire. It's possible it can work out. Bjorkgren does have a solid resume as a D-League head coach and an NBA assistant. But there were higher thought of assistant coaches out there that the Pacers could have gone after. Until tomorrow... I am Jacob Volk saying there's a hard shot at LeMaster and he throws Madlock into the dugout.